Uh, just mention a few things before I move on to the message. First of all, if this happens to be your first time, we're glad that you're here. If you're from the house, we ask that you uh, stay connected as best as possible through our church app and mainly through our text updates. You can text connect to the number that you will see on the screen. This is important for us to communicate with, with you. You can always text us back, ask questions, uh, request prayer or any other concerns that you may have. Uh, it's a joy to, uh, you know, every now and then I send out uh, an encouraging word and it's it's cool to to see the replies. Um, and uh, I'm just grateful for technology in that matter. Um, I want to thank you for being generous in the house of God, in your tithes, your offerings. Uh, you've been so, so uh, obedient to God in that um, aspect of faith. And I want to encourage you to keep on uh, being faithful, but I also want to challenge you today. Uh, it's summer, and during the summer, we do a lot of uh, summer camps and summer activities. You can find all those in our calendar, in our church app. Uh, we have uh, uh, summer adventures, we have uh, kids camp, we have youth camp, and then we have soccer camp, and then later in the year we have a man camp, and we have a, a women's retreat. Uh, but going back to the summer, uh, it always uh, brings additional cost, uh, regardless of what we do. And uh, if you've been in this house for a while, you know that we do not do fundraisers. Uh, we uh, decided, uh, Lord put it in my heart, and then talked to our leaders, and we all agreed. Um, I didn't like I didn't like how it looked to be trying to sell stuff to the community to raise funds for us for a camp. Um, we are the church. We're supposed to give away, not trying to get money from the world to do our things. And I was like, funds have to be raised from within. How? Well, through generous giving, through our ability to give above and beyond and so in the next few weeks if the lord's I, i'm going to ask you to pray about it if the lord puts in your heart to give additionally to summer camps uh we can always use the extra funds to you know um, gas traveling um, uh, bus expenses and uh in soccer camp we have to rent a tent we have to make t-shirts we have to make a soccer ball uh, i mean buy soccer balls for all the participants not make them that would be hard but um, but anyway, uh, and you may be thinking, well, don't you charge a registration? Yes, that's a minimal. And the only reason we do that is because uh, sometimes when you give everything for free, uh, sometimes people don't appreciate it. So anyway, it's a different time, different culture. Uh, and we're grateful for the ability that we have. Uh, last time we did soccer camp, we had over 100 kids. Uh, and that's the one I emphasize. And because we're going to need your help. If you can... Help us that week is Monday through Friday. It's the last week of July. We would highly appreciate uh, your time and effort uh, to run this camp. We need about a lot of volunteers. I didn't even put a number. But uh, our registration is, is coming along. And uh, in that sense, if you can like and share every time you see the event, that would help us a lot. If you have questions about summer camps, whatever that might be, you can ask us. That's why it's important to stay connected. You can always shoot us a text and ask questions or uh, messages through Facebook or whatever uh, platform you decide to use. Um, okay, now I can get to the word. You ready for God's word? Um, we have been in this, uh, I wouldn't even call it a series, it's more of a a journey with uh, with Timothy. Paul wrote uh, three letters to young pastors, first and second Timothy, and then Titus. And uh, Paul is writing with an urgency for uh, the message of the gospel to continue to be preached, regardless of the opposition and the conflict in the early church. Uh, this is only a, a few years after Jesus' resurrection. And the church is young, and Paul brings the message to not only Jews but Gentiles to uh, to uh, spread the word. When when Jesus left, he told the disciples, "You will be my witnesses in in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth." Right. Uh, the reason you and I have the message of Jesus is because uh, some early Christians that were so radical that were willing to give up their lives 
uh, for the sake of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but we've been in, in Timothy, and uh, for the sake of repetition, how many of you need repetition every now and then? Uh, on Wednesday nights when we gather before we took this summer break, uh, sometimes we would come on Wednesday night and I would ask, hey, do you remember what we talked about last week? And they would only just, you know, and then we would start talking about it and they would remember. Uh, and so for the last two weeks, we've been in Timothy and how many of you don't remember what we talked about the first week? Well, I'm not going to make you go through that because if I was you, I would probably wouldn't remember either. So um, let's try to recap briefly for the sake of making the message of Timothy uh, something accessible in your memory when you go through things in life, when you see things on Facebook, when you see things on social media, I guarantee you and my, my goal is to make us think biblically as much as we can. And so um, Paul writes to Timothy with an urgency. He, he, he tells him, you, 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 ought to, you ought to preach the gospel. There are false teachers trying to cripple in the church and tell different things and distort the message. And the first week I, I, I told you how Paul uh, didn't even finish his opening sentence. He says, I, as, I, as I urged you when I was in Macedonia, I'm urging you now to, to pretty much stand your ground. In other words, don't leave. <laughs> how many of you have tried to run away from problems just to find out that you try to run away, and then the problem finds you wherever you went. He tells Timothy, don't leave, as if Timothy perhaps was thinking about leaving because things were getting rough, were getting complicated. And he says, no, you got to stand your ground. You got to defend God's truth. And throughout the letter, he keeps telling him, remember what I told you, remember what I told you, and you ought to train others, and remember what I told you, and the true gospel, and, and stand your ground, defends God's truth, and he, he says, but you ought to aim for love. In other words, if the right motives are not in your heart, it doesn't matter how truthful you are, you will end up hurting, or dividing, or uh, uh, not doing what God has called us to do. Aim for love. And then last week, uh, you know, we, we were reminded how Christ came to save sinners. <laughs> I mean, that's the message of the cross. He came to save sinners, right? Uh, scripture says that we all have sinned. <laughs> we all, without Christ in our hearts, fall short from the glory of the Lord. That's why we need a Savior. But Paul tells Timothy to aim for love, and he also implies that it's not going to be easy to proclaim this message. He's telling Timothy, it's going to cost you something. It's going gonna, it's gonna to imply that you may have to be rejected, uh, that you may have to be criticized. It's going to cost you something. I don't know at what moment in our Christianity we pretty much uh, erase that uh, that uh, sentence that Jesus said to, uh, to, to take up our cross and follow him. <laughs> to leave everything, take, our, take up our cross and, and follow him. I don't know where we uh, decided that we could delete the part that, we, that, that says that in this world we would have trouble. <laughs> uh, that, that we will be persecuted for his sake. Right? I don't know in what moment we got so comfortable that we thought we could live our Christian life. And as long as nobody bothered us. We would be okay, right? Well, it's getting to the time where it's not going to be as easy as we have had it for the longest time in America. But for the sake of going back again to last week's message and kind of repeating myself, it's a, it's a good reminder that Christ came to save sinners. Because that means that he came for you and me. Um, but then Paul told Timothy, out of all the sinners, I was the worst. <laughs> and he says, and even though I was the worst, he still considered me a reliable vessel, a trustworthy vessel to tell others about his love. See, Christ didn't save you just to make you happy. Christ saved you to use you 
in order to save others that will see you. <laughs> uh, we said, like, we are his mercy on display. Do you have doubts about God being good? Look at yourself. He's been good, right? I mean, he's been gracious and he's been merciful. In fact, scripture says that his mercies are new every morning. You may have failed yesterday, but today is a new beginning. And as long as you can breathe, you can receive God's mercy. And you have the ability every day to choose to follow him or not. In our day... Uh, Many have uh, drifted from biblical principles, uh, and uh, I I'm deeply concerned. I I'm deeply concerned about how we have watered down the message of the gospel, how we have distorted the message of the gospel. Seems like Paul was dealing with kind of like the same conflict. The problem in that early church and the problem in the church that Timothy was trying to uh, fight against false teaching was not was not a call that was outside of Christianity was not a, another religion it was from within the church that conflict came that doubt came that false teaching came and I wonder if things have changed that much see most of us I hope you would agree are not really to the point where we, maybe some are, but the vast majority of those who claim to be Christians are not really uh, in danger of believing in other gods as in other religions. But the biggest danger is believing a distorted message within the Christian faith, a distorted interpretation of Scripture. And this has crippled in not only in our churches, but even in our Christian colleges and universities. If you're familiar with universities, you know that most of the universities that now are completely liberal used to be at the beginning Christian colleges and Christian universities. In fact, it was Christians that, that decided to to implement the, the universities, to start universities. But now we have drifted away, not only in the liberal aspects of colleges, but even in the Christian colleges, we have tried to distort the message a little bit and, and, and be permissive in some things and be so loving that we compromise the truth of the gospel. But that's not my topic today. Let me get back on track. It begins like this. We deny the reliability of Scripture. We say, well, I still believe in God, but I don't believe everything like that the Bible says. Or uh, what if there are some errors in the Bible, then I cannot trust it. And once you erase the Bible, you can do whatever you want, pretty much. I don't think things have changed in terms of what we're fighting against. Today, it's all about love without repentance. <laughs> Today, it's all about love without a change of your ways because you don't have to change. God loves you as you are. And even though that is true, then why would he send the Holy Spirit? He said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth, right? And he will convict you of sin, right? In other words... You're saved. You get a new beginning. But now the Holy Spirit comes to guide you to make you more like me. How does he do that? Well, he convinces you of his truth. He doesn't condemn you. He convinces you that his ways, as we were singing, his ways are better. And I don't know about you, but over the years I have come to realize yeah, that, yes, his ways are better because I've tried my ways and they didn't work. But here's my concern again. I... Um, Believe it or not, I still consider myself a young pastor. <laughs> Amen? Amen? There you go. <laughs> and I can be tempted to give in into this gospel that tries to not offend anyone. 
But the more I read the Bible, the more I find out that the gospel, in a sense, it's offensive. I mean, the gospel comes to tell us that we're a mess, that we're sinners. <laughs> Not only that, it tells us that on our own, we can't, we can't do anything. In fact, it tells us that even if we do, it's worthless because in the end, we can take anything with us. And doesn't matter how successful you are in life without Jesus Christ, you won't be saved. That's offensive. Are you telling me that I'm not special? Well, in a sense. Because it's also the most loving message because despite being unworthy and a mess and sinners, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. But we're living in a day when we're not willing to say those things because we don't want to offend anybody. We want to tell them, no, we, we just have to love them. We just have to love them. We just have to love them. Yes, but loving implies speaking truth. Because if we don't speak truth, there's no hope. So my point being is that we've traded the transformational gospel. Listen, transformational gospel gospel the gospel came to change your life it, it, it came not just to make you feel better about yourself it came to transform you and change you who you used to be without Christ is not how you are supposed to become with Christ and the Holy Spirit in you I mean I'm not who I used to. are you who you used to be before Christ hopefully not and if you are I wonder if you have found Christ and we have traded that transformational gospel for one that rarely challenges us to give up the desires of our flesh. Listen, this new agenda that tries to use the rainbow as a symbol of pride. I see your face. You're nervous now. It's concerning when now they're even targeting our children to try to change their mindset about it. With Jesus, it's all or nothing. He loves you as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay as you are. But it seems like we're living in a time where we're trying to preach this message of the gospel without inviting people to change. Oh, we just have to love them. Well, yes. But what I speak truth in love, right? Christ came to save sinners, to give us freedom. I'm going back to Timothy. I wish I could tell you that being a true Christian is easy, that everybody's going to like you, that everybody's going to receive you, that everybody's going to accept you. But the truth is, that won't happen. In fact, some may reject you, some may criticize you, some may talk about you, some may come after you and speak falsely about you, but it's worth it. <laughs> I know this message is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me. Because in a sense, we all want to be loved and we're all, we all want to be liked. And the message of the gospel tells us that if we stand for truth, we will be persecuted. Now, this calling is not just for me. It's for all of us. If you choose to follow Jesus, you ought to tell everybody about Jesus. And Paul in Second Timothy, before, uh, be, before or even in the middle of all his repetition, because if you read it, you'll find repetition over and over again. This is the gospel. This is, you are, this is what you ought to teach. You will be rejected. I have been rejected. Some have left me. In fact, there's a, there's, there's a chapter where he says, some have left me and I already delivered them to the devil, pretty much. This is what I'm trying to say. If you have not been paying attention to culture in our days, 
I think we should be not worried, even though I wrote worried in my notes. We should be concerned and take the gospel serious. Second Timothy chapter three says, but mark this and you ought to pull out your Bible because I think we had some issues with the notes, which is a good thing. That way you'll get to use your Bible. Second Timothy chapter three, verse one says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. At the end of uh, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, Paul is expressing how because of his willingness to preach the gospel, he's being rejected. He's not being treated well by some in the faith. And he begins with our central scripture for today in chapter 2 with a you then, you then. Chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Timothy. That's where we're going to be the rest of this uh, few minutes. You then, says, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying, if I was persecuted, you will be persecuted. If I have been rejected, you will be rejected. But you ought to stand strong in the grace of God through Jesus Christ. In the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Grace. Do you know what grace means? Grace means that you receive what you did not deserve. How many of you have been given more than you deserve? Yeah. All right. Now, we often equate uh, grace with uh, tenderness, right? I mean, God, oh, man, his grace, he's so good. He's so graceful. We, we, we equate that with a tenderness of heart, with a, with a goodness of his character. And that's a true statement. But Paul is telling Timothy, I've been rejected and persecuted, and you then ought to stay strong in the grace in Christ Jesus. In other words, grace is not just about the tenderness of God. It's about the strength and the power of our mighty God. Grace not only forgives you and gives you what you did not deserve in terms of forgiveness and blessings. It also gives you strength and power to overcome sin and fulfill your God-given purpose. Grace. I wrote it here in my notes. Grace equals strength. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For by the grace of God, but by the grace of God I am who I am. And this is not of me. This is God in me. Grace gives you power. But we often in our day hear things like, oh, it's all about his grace in terms of grace that covers your sin, grace that doesn't see your sin, but only sees Christ in you. And even though that is true, God also sees you. <laughs> then um, Paul says in verse two, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. In other words, repeat, 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 repeat. We don't have a culture of reading God's word as much as we think we do. We have a lot of Bibles, but we don't read a lot of our Bibles. We have a lot of Bible app downloads, but the reality is that sometimes the verse of the day gets us through and that's all we read. You don't have to say amen, because I know that that doesn't happen here. We all read our Bibles a lot. But if I would ask you in the way that I like to ask is, how many of you think you could read your Bible a little bit more? How many of you think you could pray a little bit more? How many of you think you could teach your children the Bible a little bit more? <laughs> There's always room for growth. That's pretty much what... Paul is saying, you, 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 ought, you ought to teach, you ought to teach, you ought to teach. 
Right now we're, uh, uh, I say we, but kids are learning the, 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 the books of the Bible. They're memorizing the books of the Bible. Well, we're going to make a challenge. If their parents memorize them, they'll get a prize too. <laughs> the Bible, the message, the gospel. I'm concerned with the message that never calls you to change, that overemphasize acceptance and a lack of repentance. Truth is, you don't hear that. that much. I mean, just turn on the radio after church, which I'm sure you do often. Most of our songs are about God loved me, God saved me, His grace covered me. Now, I'm not... I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying it's dangerous to receive all that love and never assume the responsibility to do something with it. It's a gift. Paul says, by the grace of God, for it is by grace you have been saved. <laughs> by faith, and this is not from you, this is a gift from God. It's a gift. Now, I like to give gifts, but I also like to receive gifts. And I especially love the gifts that are useful. Around Christmas time, I'm sure you end up with a lot of gifts that probably sometimes don't even open. I hope that grace and faith are not are not in that list of gifts that you didn't open because grace and faith is what carries you through this life, is what gives you purpose, it's what gives you meaning. We live for Christ, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain, Paul said. But I'm concerned. <laughs> now this is not a typical sermon, a message. This is more of a opening of my heart in terms of the concern that I have for the church that I am privileged and blessed to lead. I don't want to draw a crowd. Anybody can do that. <laughs> I want to read his word and I want to see his word work. And I've been a witness of what God has done in many of your lives. The gospel is reliable. Paul goes on to say and to illustrate what faith looks like in using three different illustrations. First, he uses a soldier and then he uses an athlete and then he uses a farmer. I just bear with me for the next 10 minutes. Second Timothy chapter two, verse three says, join me in suffering Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Like a good soldier in Christ of Christ Jesus. Now let me prove that repetition works. Like a good soldier. Oh, come on. <laughs> like, you don't have to sing it, but like a good soldier in Christ Jesus. Join me in suffering, Paul is saying, like a good soldier in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. There is one for which we live to please, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He pretty much is saying, yeah, you ought to speak truth, you ought to preach the truth, but don't get entangled in talking about, in other chapters, it says about genealogies and about, and about principles and about the end of times. But it doesn't even matter. But what gets me about this is the opening sentence, join me in my Suffering, as if following Jesus would imply suffering. When's the last time that you heard on the radio that 
you may suffer for the sake of Christ. For the most part, you hear, oh, Christ wants to bless you, use you. You're going to fulfill your purpose. You're great. Now, all those things are true, <laughs> but they're not the main message of the gospel. I like winning arguments. Do you like winning arguments? How many of you like to be right, right? <laughs> well, I, I not only like to be right, I'm, I'm almost always right <laughs> and humble. Just kidding. Paul is telling Timothy, listen, sometimes you will not win the arguments. You got to leave those things behind and keep your eyes on the orders given by your commander. We live in a time where the false teachings don't cripple in from Within, in, in a sense that, you know, when technology was not as accessible, some false teaching people would come into the church and cripple in and suddenly find themselves in positions of leadership and then would start teaching something that is not or dividing or misguiding people. But now it's so accessible that when you open up your phone and you get the link that your brother or sister send you that, Someone else sent them and it's all about how you shouldn't trust the Bible because I don't know what. And then you start believing false things about Jesus. And we don't have time to entangle in uncovering all the false teachings on YouTube. What we have time to do, it's time to be a church, open up scripture, read it together, learn it together, and then go and live it out. So I am concerned. Join me in my suffering like a good soldier. What I'm trying to say is keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on his word. And then he says like a good athlete. Similarly, verse 5. Now this one is going to challenge some of us. It says, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing According to the rules. <laughs> Come as you are. You, you don't have to do anything. It doesn't matter if you mess up because God doesn't see you. He sees Christ in you. And then they leave it at that. <laughs> oh, we, don't, we just don't want to make people feel guilty. <laughs> Yet Paul is telling Timothy, like a good athlete, who competes, the athlete does not receive the crown's victor except by competing according to the rules. In other words, you ought to live by the book. You don't have to be perfect, we hear. Well, true statement, nobody's perfect but God, right? Right? But we ought to strive for perfection. How? By living under the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. By being obedient to His voice. By making changes, ad adjustments. We don't have to leave this earth the way Christ found us when He found us. If He finds you at 20 years old, then by 30 you should be a mature Christian. And by 40, even more. And by 50, even more. And by 60, even more. Right? Right? Now, in our days, we like to give medals to all the kids that participate in the soccer tournament or basketball tournament, right? It's a medal of participation. I wish that was the case in God's kingdom. Paul is saying, it's not that way. You only get a crown if you compete according to the rules. There's obedience implied. In our culture today, we're trying to be non-offensive. And we compromise the message of the gospel. And when we don't compromise and we speak truth, then we become intolerant because we're not tolerating people. But that's not the case. 
it's not that we're intolerant, it's that we love truth. And the truth, last time I checked, is the only thing that will set us free. See, the problem of our world is sin. Sin separates us from God. It doesn't matter how pretty you paint the picture. Sin separates us from God. It doesn't matter how permissive you are. Sin separates us from God. It doesn't matter if you're not, if you're not trying to offend anybody. Sin separates us from God. And Jesus Christ went to the cross to die a horrible death to forgive that sin. But not just to forgive it, but also to erase it from our lives. And he sent the Holy Spirit so that we could, so that we could live in victory over sin. Like an athlete. And then he says, the hardworking, verse 6, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. So again, what do we hear? You don't have to work. You, it's, 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 it's only about, you, you just got to believe. It doesn't matter if you don't change. Because Christ is in you. God sees Christ in you, not you. But Paul says, no, 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 no. You gotta, you, in fact, there's another passage that says you ought to work out your salvation. <laughs> Listen, it's not that works save you. Faith, it is only by faith that we are saved. <laughs> works don't save you. Only faith saves you. But a faith that saves is a faith that works. Hardworking farmer. Reflect on what I'm saying. Verse 7. For the Lord will give you insight into all this. The Lord will give you insight into all this. The Lord will give you insight into all this. Reflect on what I said. Reflect on God's word. Meditate on it. <laughs> For the Lord will give you insight into all this. Listen, we meditate so much more sometimes in human philosophies and, and human principles that we neglect Scripture and we, la we, we fail to meditate on Scripture. But Paul says meditate on it because the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, rescinded from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Because I spoke truth, I'm chained like a criminal. But guess what? Even then I can tell you rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. And then he says, but God's word is not chained. If I could put it this way, and, and you'll hear me talk more about this burden I have in my heart about biblical teaching in the next following weeks. We have some things and some doors that God has opened for us to continue to preach the gospel and, and expand the way we, we teach the, the word and the way we, we have a foundation about the word. If you have ever wanted to grow in your knowledge of the word, you better get ready and get serious and be real. You told me a few weeks ago that you were willing to learn more. Well, there's about to be a door open for you to learn more. Here is a trustworthy saying, Paul says. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Now, don't be confused by the reality of his faithfulness. His faithfulness also means that he's just and he's righteous. A few weeks ago, we were discussing how God knows our hearts and how he knows better even than ourselves, our motives and our desires. And sometimes what we get may be what we think we don't deserve, but God knows what we need. Insight, God's word. If the team can get ready, I'm, I think we're going to worship before we leave briefly. And then, but, but I got to finish with, with some very important things. I don't know what brings you to church. I don't know what draws you to God even. Perhaps it's a need that you have every now and then. Perhaps it's that you need a, a prayer to be answered. Perhaps it's sickness or provision or guidance or a job or 
I mean, the list goes on and on, right? The, the reality is this, this, this world is just brings things into our lives that we sometimes didn't even ask for. <laughs> but I think Jesus is still more concerned about the quality of your response to his voice than about the quantity if it's in church terms about the quantity or, or, or the number of the crowd if it's in an individual sense it's he's more interested in your heart than in whatever you can give him or do for him he's more interested in my case in my intimacy with him on a day to day ba basis than on how good or bad I prepare the sermon for next Sunday or how good or bad we organize the church this Sunday or how good or bad we have the volunteers in place and the teaching in place and the screens in place and the music. He's more interested about my heart, about my response to him. And it's the same with you. In, in fact, there's, there's an instance in Mark chapter 1 where where, where a, a, a great crowd is following after Jesus and the disciples come and tell him, Jesus, they're, they're, they're coming for us. And Jesus gets up and says, no, let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the nearby villages. We got to preach the gospel there. In other words, I'm more concerned about the quality of the response than the quantity of the people. I don't want to, I don't want to go where there's a lot of people just eager to receive something from me. I, I, I want to go where people is willing to receive my sacrifice for them. He's still interested in the quality of your response than in the quantity of things that you can do or give or even give up for him. Jesus goes deeper when it comes to our needs. You think your need is what draw or, or, or what made God care about you. You, you think that, that he came to save the world because there was a lot of sickness. or pro No, he, he came to save sinners because sin separated us from him. There's a, another story in Mark chapter 2 where Jesus goes to this home and the home is packed with people and and not many more people could get into the room. And you might remember that some guys were trying to bring their friend to Jesus so that he could be healed. He was paralyzed. He couldn't move. He couldn't walk. And they had to make a hole in the roof. Do you remember that story? And they, 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 they pull him down and, and Jesus is right there. And Anybody remembers the first words that Jesus said to these men did, did he say be healed did he say get up and walk did he did he say <laughs> what the first thing that Jesus said was your sins are forgiven now stand up with me for a moment he said your sins are forgiven this is my point. Jesus knows that his need is bigger than his physical condition. Now perhaps you have problems today or circumstances in your life today, your marriage or your relationship with family or financial issues or job issues or career issues or health issues. Jesus knows that the need goes deeper than that. Now, it may or not may not be the case that perhaps there is sin in our lives. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that the main problem in a person's life is never his suffering. It's his sin. Our problem as humans is that we continually try to build our identity on anything and everything else but Jesus. And sometimes because of that, we run into circumstances and problems that grieve us, that hurt us, that discomfort us. And we think that if God would only fix those things, we would be better. But 
Even when sometimes by his grace we get those problems fixed, we don't feel any better. This is what I'm trying to say. We need to let Jesus to be our Savior. If you close your eyes, bow your head. Perhaps Jesus is not your Lord today. Or you realize that you have allowed other things to distract you from your God-given purpose. Let me tell you, Jesus wants to be Lord of your heart and of your life. He knows that your need is not your real need, but your need is the need of a, for, a need for a Savior. So as we pray and as we worship, may this be the day when Lord, when Jesus becomes Lord of our lives and Lord over everything. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father God, I'm grateful that your word still speaks, that your word still transforms, that your word still is alive. And I pray, Lord, that you will draw us closer to you. Father, we need you. We need your forgiveness. And just like Timothy, Lord, was urged to stand his ground, Lord, I pray that you give us an urgency, Lord, to stand our ground. To speak truth in love. To work hard, Lord, as soldiers, Lord, following your orders as the commander. To work hard, Lord, as an athlete competes, Lord. We want to run this run with this race with passion for you, for your presence, and for your purposes to be fulfilled in our lives, Lord. And because you're a good father, Lord, we can expect a reward, and we're grateful. We just want your presence. In Jesus' name. Church says, amen. Let's worship. After worship, you'll be dismissed. God bless you.